Good morning. Thank you for joining us today. I'm David Lashway, and I lead Baker McKenzie's Cybersecurity Global Practice. Delighted to have you all with us today. Good morning, Madam President. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Damon Wilson and the folks from the Atlantic Council, thank you for hosting today with us. Jim Shuto from CNN is here as well and will be carrying the day in the discussion this, later this morning. So thank you all. Distinguished guests, Mr. Chertoff, thank you for being here. It's good to see you and some old friends, Chris Painter and others from the State Department. Thank you for joining us today. Yesterday, Madam President, while at the White House, you reminded us of the blue, black, and white of your flag. And that you will always remember that it flew in a, here in America when it could not fly in Estonia during 50 years of the 100 years that we celebrate during your visit today due to occupation. You reminded us as well of our partnership to confront challenges and that that partnership is based upon three common things. One, an understanding. Two, the rule of law. And three, and perhaps most importantly, common beliefs. You said that we form the axis of the good based upon these. We are proud to fly the blue, black, and white of your flag here today. And we welcome you to the discussion to advance our common beliefs and understanding around cybersecurity and other security risks, both in Estonia, in Europe more generally, and here in the United States. Marie Under, perhaps the most notable 20th century Estonian poet who lived during Soviet occupation and wrote of her experience. In her famous poem, Night, wrote, in hand in hand, we walk uphill together. I hope that through the discussion today, we will go hand in hand through this discussion and through what will confront us in cyber in the days ahead. And finally, as we were just discussing this morning, and as you mentioned yesterday, you reminded us Americans to reflect on the words that are carved in the granite monuments around our mall. That caused me to pause this morning and think for a moment of all the different statements that are carved across the mall that we look out at today. And on the 50th anniversary of Martin Luther King's death, no statement came to mind more than this perhaps one of the great American poets, in Mr. King. If we are to have peace on earth, he said, our loyalties must transcend our race, our tribe, our class, and our nation. And this makes us better and in common, and we must develop a world perspective. Thank you for sharing your perspective today. Thank you for joining us, and we look forward to the discussion. Good morning and welcome everyone. I'm Barry Pavel. I'm a senior vice president at the Atlantic Council and I direct the Scowcroft Center on, on uh, strategy and security there. On behalf of the council, I'm really honored to, um, to welcome you to our conversation with, with President Calulate of the Republic of Estonia, especially since this is her first public event here in Washington, D.C. And uh, Madam President, thank you so much for being, for being here with us again. I'd also like to welcome those of you who are following the webcast online. Please feel free to join the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag US Baltic Summit and the account at uh, CyberStateCraft. In today's discussion, we'll be touching on issues that, that, in my view, will be key to the decade unfolding ahead of us. And those issues include artificial intelligence, blockchain, and cybersecurity, all matters on which uh, President Calulate has a strong voice and leadership particularly given her presidency of a country undertaking what the New Yorker has called the most ambitious project in technological statecraft today. Estonia has been at the cutting edge of the digital revolution since well before most of us were actually calling it a revolution. By the late 1990s, all of Estonia's schools were online, and since then, it's gone digital on all its government services and set up data embassies outside the country to safeguard 
that information. That's the kind of cyber foresight that we could use more of, and that's why we're so proud to have President Calulade with us today. At the Atlantic Council, we've redoubled our efforts toward fostering an international community of like-minded states and reinvigorating an adapted set of global norms and rules built on common principles such as openness, transparency, and the rule of law. Sometimes we do that the old-fashioned way through diplomacy and summits, but we're also passionate about innovating wherever useful and needed. Estonia's project of digital statecraft, or e-Estonia, perfectly mirrors that spirit of much needed innovation. By leveraging technology to transform everything from voting to citizenship, Estonia has shown us how to bring these tried and tested values forward into this century. But of course, introducing a digital, digital element to governance also introduces risks, as Estonia itself knows very well from the cyber attacks of 2007. The very freedom and connectivity that makes our societies what they are also opens us to malicious activities undertaken by those who oppose our values, as Lieutenant General McMaster outlined so passionately and eloquently before some of us at the Atlanta Council last evening in his final public remarks as National Security Advisor. Estonia used the, Estonia used the 2007 attack to turn its vulnerabilities into strengths, and it's now widely considered a global leader on cybersecurity with Tallinn hosting the NATO Cooperative Cyber Defense Center of Excellence, but it underscores the need for us to devote real resources to protecting our increasingly information-based societies. And though we are already doing much to safeguard ourselves, as General McMaster said, much more work remains to be done on all fronts and in very close coordination with our allies. And that's why at the Scowcroft Center we devote so many sustained efforts to strengthening cyber statecraft, working closely with key allies in every region of the world. And that's why we organize teams to visit the Baltics, as we are doing next week, for example, to engage more directly with our allies to help shore up deterrence, defense, and resilience against the foremost security challenges that we face. And with that, let me introduce President Calulate and our moderator, Jim Shuto, to, to speak to both the promise and peril of digital statecraft. Before becoming the President of Estonia in 2016, President Calulate served as a member of the European Court of Auditors from 2004 to 2016, where she organized the financial audit of EU R&D funds, among many other leading responsibilities. She also was the economic advisor to the Prime Minister from 1999 to 2002, as well as CFO and CEO of the IRU Power Plant. Leading our discussion today will be Jim Shudo, Chief National Security Correspondent of CNN, most importantly a Villanova fan, for those of us from that, that area, um, with his extensive experience reporting overseas across Asia, Europe, and the Middle East. We couldn't have asked for a better guide for this conversation. He was the only American journalist to embed with U.S. Special Forces during the Iraq invasion. He has reported undercover from inside Myanmar, and he reported Iran's first reaction to President Obama's 2014 State of the Union remarks. Before we turn to Jim and President Calulate, I wanted to thank Baker and McKinsey for hosting us today. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks David Lashaway, partner here at the firm, also for his continuous support of our cyber efforts at the Atlantic Council. And now let's get to the good stuff. Thanks again, and I'll hand it over to our esteemed panelists. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. Thanks so much to the Atlantic Council, Baker and McKenzie, uh, and, and thank you to President Calulade for allowing me to sit across from you and throw a few questions your way. Um, I've, had, I, I've had the good fortune of spending some time in Estonia and, and interacting with, with Estonian officials, uh, interviewed the foreign minister uh, as I've covered the Russia story and, and um, had some nice visits there as well, and I feel lucky for that. In fact, I spent my birthday last year in Estonia. And, uh, as, as you know, it's just, it's remarkable position, I think, in what has become a dominant national security line for the U.S. as a neighbor to Russia, as one of the first victims of a coordinated Russia cyber attack in 2007, really unprecedented, but, but foreshadowing of things to come. Uh, and yet, as a country, doubling down, all in on a digitized society without hesitation and, and with full confidence. 
uh, and finding that way forward. Certainly a lot of lessons to be learned there, I think, for, uh, for Europe and for the U.S. Um, subject today, of course, artificial intelligence, etc. I do want to start, if I can, just in light of your visit here and your time yesterday in the White House. Uh, I'm curious, do, do you have confidence that the U.S. is a solid partner for you as you face uh, challenges from Russia, particularly cyber challenges from Russia? Yes, uh, I have to say I have great confidence in uh, this administration and in American people. And uh, as I also said yesterday, this confidence is not unfounded. It has foundation in, uh, in this common shared value base, which we all have. And if you don't diverge from that, then uh, I think uh, it's pretty obvious that we can have confidence. And I have to say that we've had really good cooperation with this administration since it took office. Uh, High-level visits, visitor visits, uh, and uh, lots of discussions also on the side. Uh, also, uh, well, playing the same hand on in the discussion of, of for example, on uh, nuclear uh, nuclear weapons uh, in 21st century, considering also technological aspects in Munich Security Conference with your uh, now uh, Vice Minister Foreign Affairs, etc. So the contacts are, are close and numerous, and, uh, and this gives us confidence to say this, and uh, it doesn't sound hollow coming from me. Um, if I could start on, I, I want to get to artificial intelligence very quickly, but just, to, just on cyber, to describe to folks, one thing that struck me when I was in Estonia is just the frequency of cyber attacks. The, 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 this, is, this is a daily event, many times a day. These are the numbers of, of the way it works, right? It doesn't come in, you know, in pairs or in dozens. It comes constantly. Um, how is it today? And, and, and where are the attacks coming from? How aggressive are they? And how do you push back? First of all, just because you haven't seen this in the United States, it doesn't matter. That, it doesn't matter. They exist. And I'm quite sure you also have the systems where these attacks are logged and analyzed, as we also uh, learned uh, that you have analyzed and found that quite a number of them actually came from Russia. So nothing unique in Estonia. And uh, this is how it is. In most of the cases, you don't analyze. You just deter and uh, this attack and neutralize it, but you don't analyze where it comes from because they are well, very numerous. But in case you see a pattern, or in case you see that somebody is going after vital systems, then of course you would analyze also where they, uh, where they came from. But in most of the cases, it simply doesn't uh, give, have any economic or political sense to, uh, to deal with this because attribution will be difficult anyway and if you do not have a particular reason to, uh, to try to understand why this system or when, then you just don't go after it. It's, it's just how cyber world works. In, and, uh, and I don't think that uh, it will ever change. This is how it is forever. The, the outgoing National Security Advisor, H.R. McMaster, said last night that, and he's not alone in this, you've heard this from many members of the administration, but also from folks outside, that the U.S. and the West have not yet imposed sufficient costs on Russia to deter activity, not just cyber activity, other activity in Ukraine, etc. Do you agree with that? I think there is considerable space to uh, uh, leave room. What else we could do, and uh, which has come to many people's mind, is to go after the Russian money, corrupt money, kleptocracy, to go after something which will really hurt. Also, after Ukraine happened, the, the discussion was whether or not to throw uh, Russia out of the, uh, of the uh, international uh, money uh, transfer schemes. Uh, another option, for example, but I think uh, reactions need to be uh, proportionate and, and meanwhile it's also wise to say that uh, we keep talking as well. But talking always needs to take place from the point of strength, this we must never forget as well. And our strength, this comes from only one source, this is the unit. And we know and we see and we observe it uh, very often that, uh, for example, when uh, uh, there are attempts to uh, break uh, our front, let's say, on sanctions on Ukraine, then there is quite uh, clever, uh, well, quite clever Russian presence trying to understand where these cracks are appearing and, and trying to uh, use these cracks immediately. And I would even say that uh, quite often Russia goes where it thinks that this uh, common resolve uh, may be neglecting this part of Europe or, uh, or region. I think uh, this happened in Georgia, I think this happened in Ukraine. These countries were trying and uh, and were trying trying to come closer to Europe for some time, and uh, obviously Europe was slow to uh, to provide clear roadmaps and uh, clear opportunities and possibilities on how to come closer if not become members. 
So uh, we saw that uh, things went wrong. And uh, it, actually the same line, in my mind, reaches to Salzburg. Maybe there was an understanding that EU solidarity is broken because of Brexit. Well, now we proved it isn't, and it never will be. Europe has a clever knack of never mixing different subjects. And uh, this is what, of course, we are doing here as well. In the case, in cases like this where you have comprehensive and quite damaging cyber attacks, in your view, does Article 5 apply? I am quite sure that also if you read the academic analysis of, uh, of uh, what uh, cyber might cause and that it can have as devastating consequences to uh, nation security as, uh, as conventional attacks, then I'm quite sure that there you, we can imagine situations where Article 5 would apply. But until you have tested, you never know. On the other hand, you don't want to bring the threshold of calling Article 5 low. So it will always be a difficult question on how to uh, move forward. But that is the, the, that is the Russian strategy, is it not to, to pursue activities and attacks that are just below the perceived th threshold of a coordinated response? Yes, but when it becomes dangerous to a country's uh, security and sovereignty, then you know that you have to go and say this is an Article 5 situation. Now, did you consider that in 2007? Because this was quite a, I mean, this was an attack designed to cut Estonia off, right, in effect? First of all, 2007 attack was in no way dangerous to Estonia's uh, security. Because uh, what Estonia was able to do in 2007, it walled off the country. Inside the country, services were running. So Estonia was not down. What was down was the external connection to Estonia. I was in Luxembourg, I couldn't access my bank account, but all Estonians in Estonia could, and the services were up and running. So it definitely was not an attack which, would have, which could have actually been a risk to this country's security. In addition, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't uh, well effective in, uh, in attacking the vital systems of the country. Uh, digital governance systems, yes, but uh, I mean, nobody dies if they are down for two hours. They were mostly functional, and they were just uh, walled off from the rest of the internet world. The simple uh, denial of the service attack, which nowadays is, is very common. So definitely that would not have been an, uh, an Article 5 case. But if you think of the whole 2007 situation with Russia provoking also, uh, also uh, uh, well, people uh, well, fighting on the streets for a couple of nights, etc. So you had, you had a more dire situation than just a cyber attack, and you had to see all these facts together. There was a cyber attack combined with what else was going on in the country, and that is why the uh, European partners and allies also came out in strong support of Estonia, calling out that this is Russia. And uh, this is very important that this call came, that uh, nobody then asked the attribution questions, etc., probably because they couldn't yet. I mean, this was not a common thinking then. Uh, everybody was in shock and awe that cyber attack against the nation can exist at all. But uh, nevertheless, uh, the support was, uh, was uh, well, as we see it today when uh, something like this happens. There was a good piece last week, I, I believe it was by Max Boot, who, ma who made the argument that the U.S. and NATO is in effect fighting the last war again, making that mistake of fighting the last war, that in this environment of hybrid warfare, like you experienced in, in, in 2007 and see elsewhere today, uh, that it's not about buying more literal combat ships, right? That you, know, the, the, you need to focus on the right tools, whether they be offensive cyber weapons, etc. Do you have a concern that, that that's the case, that, that folks are looking backwards as opposed to forwards, especially with Estonia that, that by its very nature looks forward in terms of technology? Yes, but um, first of all, uh, just because you have new kinds of risk doesn't make the old kind of risks to, <laughs> to disappear, unfortunately. Just ask the Ukra Ukrainian. If it, if it were that, I would be extremely happy and uh, maybe even welcome these new risks which are geographically neutral because then, of course, uh, our geopolitically seismic region, region will not be any more geopolitically seismic because globally we are... And it's only partially a joke, but uh, if you think um, seriously where Russia is ahead of us, well, we know that NATO is stronger than Russia, but if you look at, let's say, uh, eastern uh, border of NATO and conventional capacities, then Russia has considerable might there. If you now think that you are, uh, you, you are seeing what is happening to your country's economy and technological development, because, uh, well, Russia is very 
proud that after Ukrainian sanctions and its own counter sanctions by which Russia doesn't buy agricultural products anymore uh, from European market, that it is now an independent, uh, well, independently able to feed its own population, then this is wonderful. You are a primary sector export and you are a great agrarian country, 21st century. Something's missing, technology is missing. Russia is losing out on technology development because of our sanctions, big time. I'm quite sure that if Georgia had never happened, Russia would be part of the Horizon 2020 European R&D program because Georgia, for example, is participating in that program. So they must see that uh, they're losing in their might. I mean, it's not so big country, it's not economically well off, and its prognosis is bad. So, and you still have some conventional advantages somewhere globally. I think this is particularly the time when you need to be vigilant in your analysis and in your response to be able to deter if there would be a sudden attempt to try to turn the tables. Therefore, we cannot neglect convention conventional risks even if there are new risks. And uh, I think it's more true today than maybe it was, uh, let's say, 10 years ago. You, you raise a point, which is something of a contrarian point of view here in the US, that, that the perception that Russia is winning is misplaced, that in fact uh, they're paying a very high cost in ec economic terms, technological terms. You know, if you, if you, you know, t to echo uh, to some degree as you did, Senator John McCain, Russia's a gas station, right? You know, that, that you know, it's still basically a, a petro economy, um, not great to, to, to travel. Producing really good yogurt as well nowadays. What's that? Producing really good yogurt as well nowadays, well, which uh, is fine. <laughs> I mean, have to give a country credit it deserves. Big picture, do you, are you making an argument that Russia's losing? Yes. Strategically? Yes, strategically Russia is losing. Uh, and uh, therefore, I think we need to take this very seriously, what their analysis of the situation might be. What, when will the window of opportunity of turning the tables suddenly on us close? We don't know this. We don't know what's the analysis, and we don't know also well, on technical level when is the moment. Turning the tables meaning a, a catastrophic attack meant to... Something going really down. wrong, yes. In conventional sphere, in somewhere else, something like Salisbury, I mean, we didn't... If somebody had told you two months ag ago that this will happen, would you have thought it's probable? No. So uh, I think we need to be very vigilant right now. Do you, do you envision that... Uh, again, I'm asking you to predict, which I know that no politician likes to do, but, but are, you, are you speaking in the cybersphere, are you speaking in the kinetic sphere, or it could be a whole range? I'm speaking in cybersphere, and I think uh, Russia aside, we need to think much more seriously how we treat internationally uh, the risks stemming from, uh, from the cyber, and also from the fact that we have more and more self-learning systems, and also I think we should think about uh, that maybe Elon Musk and Jan Tallinn and others, that they write about AI. And they put the probability of having AI uh, at 50% at uh, 2050. Well, I take this with a pinch of salt because I have a degree in genetic engineering. And when I was studying in university in the 90s, then everybody was sure that we will clone people by 2010. And we are very, very far from that. So I don't know whether we should take it seriously. But at least I know this, that we can create uh, systems which are self-learning and pretty autonomous, looking like AI to most people. So we should actually understand what new kinds of risks stem from that. And uh, I particularly love the, uh, the example of an, uh, of an close to AI or even AI worm in somebody's nuclear system. It doesn't matter whose. It, uh, this, uh, this could be the system of an axis of good or an axis of bad. It doesn't matter really. But imagine you have a worm and it's in somebody's system. And it's uh, self-learning and uh, we've sent it into the system thinking that we know what it will find as equipment, as software in that system. And then it finds something uh, unexpected. For example, somebody has taken a contaminated computer to the system, very common thing. Somebody read internet on the same computer, then connected it to some technical system. And this our AI little worm now reads this information. And uh, this changes our understanding because we thought it will only read and learn about the system. But he read a piece of news. And this piece of news said that United Nations getting ready to ban AI for military use. And this system is in the nuclear element. 
and it knows it is AI, and it knows the system where it is is military, what will happen? And it's not as sci science fiction as, as it sounds. Maybe this particular example still is. But I use it to explain that, I mean, we have uh, loads of things which might come not necessarily from state and government actors. Artificial intelligence, as far as we see now, will not be created by a public actor. It will be created probably by somebody else. Where, we don't know. When, we don't know. We know it hasn't been created because, according to the current technology development, it would eat so much energy that we would notice that somewhere globally energy is, uh, is being used to this extent. But it might happen, and we are not even discussing about how international law should apply, what should be our measures, countermeasures. For example, we could agree at the United Nations level that if we detect that energy is somehow being used in a concentrated way somewhere, or that somebody has built a neural, net, a neural uh, uh, network like computer network somewhere, this would trigger an inspection. Are we discussing it? No, we are only discussing the cyber conventional and failing even there to agree how exactly international law should apply in cybersphere. I think we are so far behind the curve of where we should be. And I think this is now urgent discussion which we should be having. But you don't have many takers, I have to say. There's a great quote, and I, don't, I can't quote it from memory, that, that, uh, that Putin said at a conference last year about the country that controls AI will, will dominate in a number of ways. And, and I, I often read that quote at speeches and ask folks who they think said it. And they always say, oh, Elon Musk or something like that. It's Putin. He's clearly thinking in these terms. Wh who's, who, to our knowledge, is ahead on AI? China, Russia, the US, Estonia? Um, my guess is that it's in private sector, not in government sector right now. But indeed, what I, w I noticed this quote, and I was very worried, because normally President Putin speaks. He, in his, if we look back in retrospective, I mean, all the discussion about the uh, geopolitical catastrophe of uh, breaking down the Soviet Union, thereafter came, tries to negotiate, then, then Georgia, etc. Sometimes you hear something, well, we've heard very often, for example, that uh, Baltic states are very stupid to leave the uh, Russian electricity grid because, of course, it's technically very stable, and the, which is true, by the way, it is technically very stable. Yet we know that he spent a lot of money to make sure that his structures will not suffer if we are pushed off the grid suddenly. Uh, right now, this is not still possible, but it is. So this makes us to work with the European Commission to make sure that we could be uh, deconnected from, uh, from that grid as quickly as possible. And, uh, and connect it to the uh, European electricity uh, grid, even if, I mean, economically, it doesn't, uh, well, make much sense to do this. But it's, it's clear that if you hear these things, you need to think about what that might mean. Similarly, there was a call for respect and then Salisbury. So, indeed, we need to pay attention that uh, artificial intelligence, if it happens in uh, somewhere, then we need to detect it quickly. We need to detect it quickly especially in case it will be in the, on the axis of bad, not on the axis of good. But my guess is it will be private sector. So now I'm going to ask you to predict again. Uh, y you said that folks, you know, years ago predicted we'd already be cloning dogs and cats and human beings and, and we're, we're not there yet. How many years or decades off do you think the breakthrough is? I cannot, I'm not a specialist in that field, but uh, looking at, again at this uh, benchmark of genetic engineering, then we cannot, uh, well, we can make bacteria with some characteristics which we wanted it to have, that's all. And we are eight years past the date we were supposed to clone human beings. So it might take time, but this doesn't change the fact that, I mean, autonomous systems, self-learning autonomous systems can mimic pretty closely something which is AI. It will not be as, uh, as science fiction, but uh, it, uh, it may be nevertheless as dangerous, almost as dangerous. It's just that it's easier to predict what it thinks, in, well, thinks in quotation marks, of course. But this example, what I came about, the war in nuclear system, this doesn't need to be AI. It could be actually a, a well-learning uh, automated system just happening on the uh, wrong piece of information. My example was understandable for us but we are talking machines there. There might be other technical data which is not understandable for us right now here, which will actually push it off the course. And we need to be ready for these kind of developments. And, and self-learning systems like that exist today? Yes, we have self-learning systems playing really good uh, board games. We know that. Mm -hmm. um, 
for a digitized economy like Estonia, uh, which has created, of course, many jobs and opportunities for its population, uh, but of course, technology, as we know, often replaces human jobs with, with machines, et cetera. Is, is the approach of AI and, and the existence of self-learning something, you know, a rough equivalence today? What does that do to the future of work? I think it will do good to the future of work. First of all, already now we can see that the current uh, mediocre level of technology use, what the humankind is able to achieve, is changing the work, work already. I mean, the fact that I can work from Tallinn for somebody in America or in France or in Australia demonstrates it. People don't need enterprises anymore to uh, get the best added value of their skills. They don't need broad skills, they can be extremely narrow skills. And, uh, and they could sell them globally because you can sell them online, which po poses a huge question, who will get the taxes? And without taxes, we, not, we will not be able to help our people to pass this transfer. Sometimes people think that the nature of the job will change only for well-learned and educated people, but I think it is a great e equalizer, in fact, because uh, um, you, can, you can actually be somebody who does something very classic, like handicraft, but you will be able to sell it globally. We have in Estonia this, uh, this case. So there is a South African man living in a small county in the middle of nowhere, basically, in Estonia. And he makes bows and arrows. They're really good, I've, I've understood, because they sell globally <coughs> for high price. And, uh, but he just prefers to live where, I mean, his clients, the closest client, I think, was more than 2,000 two kilometers away. So an example. And even for handicapped people, let's imagine you have an, well, an autistic person who is ready to knit socks, but the only red ones. Probably in, in uh, his vicinity, he wouldn't find enough takers. And uh, since he's incapable to socialize, he cannot sell. But online and globally, probably he finds enough. I mean, uh, these people who love the, just these red socks. So you can sell and, and you can have a job. In previously, such a person would have been unemployed. So there are numerous ways of how uh, the, uh, well, the work is changing. And, uh, and what I hate most is that uh, let's tax robots and pay subsistence fees to people. And it always takes me back to the change from agricultural economies to industrial. Uh, what if we had taxed tractors and paid subsistence fees to agricultural workers who lost their jobs? Would they have taken up industrial jobs? They wouldn't. And I admit that this transfer was extremely painful. But it was painful because we didn't have social systems and education. So now our uh, difficult equation is actually how to keep our social systems and education going when the traditional tax system is obviously going with traditional work system. We gathering every morning into an enterprise and working the same enterprise, having a home address and demanding uh, services in one country globally. This is all going and we'd better start talking about it right now. And uh, my understanding is that in the future, a country will be a hub for people, a dock where you kind of... I've agreed with Estonia that it provides me social and educational services, my children online tutoring in Estonian language wherever they are globally, but it doesn't necessitate me to have a postal address in Estonia or something. It's a deal between me and this country. And the problem, of course, is that if we are lazy in this thinking, then um, either we will lose these services or they will all get privatized, which will actually lower their inclusivity, which might not be a problem for you here in America, but definitely is for us in Europe, because our people expect us to provide a kind of uh, school system, health system, healthcare system, which is available to more or less everybody. So we are much more afraid of, uh, of uh, these kind of developments, that we may lose our tax base. But if we are rigid and say to people that unless you do it the old-fashioned way, we don't provide you with services, then they will opt out and go private, or simply go without and then try to opt in, because only pension system penalizes late opt-in. Healthcare system does not penalize late opt-in in any way. Educational system for your children neither. I mean, we need to fi figure it out, because otherwise we will lose the best proportion of earnings, uh, tax-wise, from the younger part of our population. And if you look globally, UK, Netherlands, Estonia, the number of independently working people is already radically growing. So I'm not talking about tomorrow. I'm talking today, and we need to uh, really think about globally and internationally what to do about it. You know, this is happening as we have, a, we have a crisis of confidence in a whole host of institutions here in the U.S. I, I'm a member of the fake news media. Uh, you heard the president standing next to you make a reference to the fake news yesterday. But it, it, it's, 
affecting our technology companies as well. I mean, Facebook's position in, in the wake of Russian interference in the election. Um, how much of a challenge is that? Do you see any similar loss of confidence or, or fear of big tech in Estonia? And if not, how, how have you avoided that? Uh, we fear Facebook as everybody else, of course. This is pretty obvious, but uh, the difference is we have alternatives to Facebook. We have secure internet communication channels as well. And uh, I've run around the globe for a year and a half telling everybody that this is unfair that governments have left people and businesses in the internet without governmental support. Because in the real world or analog world, you don't imagine that you cannot identify the other person with whom you are talking or interacting or contracting at least. At that point, at least you would ask for a passport. You don't board a plane without knowing that everybody has dutifully shown up their passports. So we know with whom we are flying all the time. For some reason, governments have failed to notice that their people and their businesses are in internet. And it's a big part of every transaction and quite a lot of communication change is online. And I feel governments have exactly the same obligation uh, in the digital sphere to provide people with identification. Estonians have had this way of establishing safe corridors in internet to communicate because uh, using your digital identity also uh, will create an encrypted channel. So it is first safe, and second, you know with whom you're talking. And this kind of internet connection is not dangerous. So our people are not afraid of using, of using digital signatures, but of course they also worried about somebody taking uh, their data on Facebook. And uh, also, uh, we can differentiate. We know this. It's, it's weird, but uh, well, I know people have fun with, with this kind of things. For example, one of my friends had this, uh, somebody told that in Estonia there exists uh, uh, well, an air doctor and his name is, is, is Dr. Air. So he, she wanted to check whether this is really true and she googled and for two months afterwards got all kinds of air remedies, uh, hearing devices, these kind of advertisements. So people automatically assume that uh, this is okay for kind of consumer services, but for some reason they didn't realize that if this is going on, then of course this is going on also for political debate. And our people, since they can differentiate between safe and unsafe internet a little bit better, because we have a safe one as well, and we are not forced to use the unsafe one if we don't want to, then I think they are a bit more resilient uh, than people elsewhere. Uh, yet they are afraid, of course. And they simply don't use Facebook in that case, of course, if they are afraid. Nobody would anyway contract over Facebook. I don't know. That would be weird. So, Also, I've noticed that... Uh, in Estonia, people pay uh, for in internet. If they have transacted and signed a contract, then you don't use your credit card for payment, but you use safe channel. You go to your bank, log in online, and make an online payment. It doesn't take much longer, but is much safer. And people prefer this and consider this safer than using credit cards online. But they do it because it's as comfortable. If it were more comfortable or not possible comfortably to pay, you'd need to walk to bank office, for example. Then they would use credit cards. So it has to be there. The good internet has to be comfortable and available. And it starts from identification. I cannot uh, repeat this uh, often enough. It's our obligation as, as governments to realize people have to have safe identification means in the internet sphere as they have in real life. You have the advantage of having a genetic engineering degree. so very aware of, of the health implications of a highly digitized society, particularly as it relates to privacy. Um, in light of what you were just discussing, social media, et cetera, how do you, how do you handle those? Because, of course, no one is more concerned about their privacy than when it comes to, to health information. I think all Estonian politicians always ask this question from all audiences. Do you know who read your doctor's notes last? Was it your doctor or somebody you don't know? When we in Estonia, if somebody reads our, uh, I don't know, tax declaration, uh, health information, you know. But, uh, I mean, sometimes people think that Estonia is, is a kind of wild world of, in world of internet. It isn't. It's actually a much stronger regulated world of internet. Our government has given people numerous guarantees that they will know if somebody uh, looks around in their data. We also gather genetic information of our people, it's another legally permissive uh, environment result of Estonian way of having a state. We, we know much more uh, of our, our people's, well, genetic data, common markers for common illnesses. 
and we are enlarging this project. And, uh, and people are not afraid to participate because state has given guarantees about how this data is to be handled. Even your doctor wouldn't see it if you don't want it. But then probably you don't want first to have this. And this is, of course, voluntary whether you do or you don't. So we have Estonian Genome Foundation created at the same time as uh, more or less as the digital Estonia. And it's very similar in, in what we did in digital. Uh, we probably have done other things, but they have not flied. This flight, it flied for short term from uh, 2000 to 2003. Uh, because, you know, we created this uh, environment where populational genetics was legal. And it wasn't in most countries globally. It was in Iceland. Iceland was our only competitor, but luckily they have even tinier populations. So to do population genetics in a population of 300,000 is, uh, is more of a joke than doing it in 1.3 million, which is still a joke, but something. <laughs> so um, private companies flocked in and paid for founding Estonian Genome Foundation. It was done on... Uh, investment banking finance only. But then what happened? The governments came in, the other governments, and ruined the market because they, of course, started to buy all these services because, of course, companies were clever enough to say that you have to pay. It's not enough to create legal space. And then for 10 years, it was dormant until the technology became so cheap that now we can continue with, uh, with helping our people to understand uh, their genetic risks of having heart attack or uh, diabetes too and other these common ailments. But again, uh, very often people ask them that, are you afraid of? Uh, and we say no, because we know that this data is protected, the state knows how to protect data, and, uh, and it's, in, it's still in my ownership. I mean, yes, it is in some kind of a database, but I own it. It's not state's, it's mine. And I decide who uses it and how. Personally, I don't mind if you know that my diabetes 2 risk is high. I mean, it is, but, but uh, that's fine with me. So I can tell it openly. And I think it's important we work on these uh, areas as well, because 90% um, of the world's population, when they feel sick, what do they do first? Google. Nowadays, what you have on Google is mostly rubbish medical information. But you need to have solid alternatives for people. So medical doctors need to have access to people's data, of course, without names and everything. So to analyze and create self-learning medical doctors who are able to respond to people. NHS in Great Britain is uh, experimenting, uh, actually, that if people call in the emergency line and it's established that, in fact, it's not an emergency, then they are trying with, uh, with, uh, with a robot to try to uh, well direct this person to go to pharmacy or to go to doctor or whichever way. But these systems have to have databases to learn and donating your information to them, health information or genetic information in an anonymous format is a great thing to do for humanity. But it needs to be safe and it can be safe. But, but how could you, I guess the issue is even with regulation, the question becomes confidence, right? And confidence and security because I'm someone, and listen, I, I have such a baseline level of, of digital knowledge, but, but I have an assumption, and this is partly because of the work that I do, but I also I lived in China, I have assumption that there is no actual privacy because I've been a victim of, of three or four of the three or four biggest hacks, uh, the OPM hack, the Anthem Healthcare uh, one, and I forget what the other one, I've lost track. I have so many free digital ID services paid for by various entities that mishandled my information. I, I don't even know. So how do you get those two to come together? Because you can have that knowledge, but without confidence, then, you yeah. know. First thing first. This is the big problem of developing digital uh, country like Estonia. Lots of uh, digital services provided online, indeed, with identification, with, I don't know, you use some username and some code, and then you write it on your computer, have a special file in your computer, etc. It's unsafe, terribly unsafe. Or take a very, it's a concrete example. I got it from Rudy Giuliani, or I put the example together, but I learned from him. Uh, E-prescription is pretty popular in the United States, but it's an email. I'm sorry. And when something goes wrong with this email, e-prescription, then confidence in all e-prescriptions is down the drain, including ours. But our e-prescription system is much safer. You, you can never say it's absolutely safe, but it's definitely safer than paper analogs. So uh, I'm quite sure I can call it safe. But when something goes wrong in one service, people lose trust in others. And that is where we need to guard the confidence and trust of our people constantly explaining to our people where we differ. 
we are not, I mean, holding this to ourselves. Actually, we very much like to expand our, our X-Road, what we call, which is our identification system. Finland is using the same, and we can change real-time real data with them. We don't because we haven't sol solved it legally, but technically we already can, in, for example. So we are open to others to use ours or similar systems. We are not telling that you cannot do it, but if you come with us into this world, you have to take responsibility to explaining to your people how these services work. And in addition, you have to promise that you make some promises to your people about how, and, and then you have to apply this in your law base, how you use this data, how you protect this data, what is your obligation vis-a-vis -vis your people in case you have this data. For example, I would absolutely refuse to distribute our X-Roads technology to a country for which I knew that it has, uh, let's say, only one single database where it attempts to gather all the information about its citizens, etc. But, I mean, if you do it in a smart, smart and sharp way and protect this also legally, what you are doing, and protect your people, it can be done. Not only in Estonia, there are others following. Denmark is quite a good example, Luxembourg is quite a good example. We're all small, but uh, it's something. Um, before, I do want to go to the audience soon. I do want to ask you about blockchain because I know this is at the top of your list of interests. Is the, and just out of curiosity, and you know far more than me, but the, the bursting of the Bitcoin bubble, or at least the volatility there, is that just a bump on the road towards all the potential of blockchain technology? Well, do you want to talk blockchain or Bitcoin? Let's agree on that first. It's an example. <laughs> Totally bad example. Let's take then Bitcoin. <laughs> and, um, and for Bitcoin, you don't need to be a, a well-established well macroeconomist to understand that money needs economy and a link to a real economy. Then you know whether you have too much money, too little money, is it overvalued, undervalued, all this. I ask you, where's the underlying economy of Bitcoin? There isn't. Or if there is, then we cannot measure it. Therefore, you cannot understand what's the value of Bitcoin. This much about Bitcoin, I mean, this is an illusion. This has an interesting afterthought, uh, if I think more about the Bitcoin situation. A well-known AI example says that AI is dangerous because it will make the world into paper clips. And then people say, no, no, AI will not be so stupid as to make the world into paper clips. And I've also thought that maybe it wouldn't, but now I mean, we are not AI, we are human beings, and we mine Bitcoin, we spend real life resources to the detriment of our environment, lots of energy, etc., and other resources to mine something which has absolutely no value. So, I mean, where exactly are we better than AI here in this problem? Now to blockchain, this is a different thing. Blockchain is a technology which allows different systems to keep track about what different systems around it, with which it is connected, are doing. And we think this is very useful technology. Uh, it's it's um, one step forward from what we have, because our digital signature for a normal person would look pretty much like blockchain because it's signature and it's time stamped. It's similar enough for experts to look for the authors of Bitcoin in Estonia, but uh, it's not the same technology. So blockchain allows, for, for our case, um, we think it will allow our state to go proactive in offering services. How? Right now, we still have to apply for state digital services one by one. For example, you have a child, you register the birth, then you apply for social services. People are starting to ask this question that I mean government. You promised you only ask once. Now you have the information that I have a baby. And, uh, and we are entitled to a certain payment for this baby. Uh, it's not relevant how much you earn. We have universal child support in Estonia. So why on earth government? You now force me to apply even if I can do it online. Why I need to go to some home page and, I mean, ask for this service? You can simply provide it to me. I have the baby, you know my bank account because it's, um, I pay taxes. And, and you know I'm entitled to this money. So why should I ask? And the answer is because we don't have blockchain. Our systems do not have the capacity to make sure that, I mean, one system, what one system is doing, that something's not going wrong at the same time in the different system. Blockchain will help us to solve this problem. Our pilot is not social, uh, social security because this is a high confidence level demanding service. 
Our pilot there is a traffic accident, simple traffic accident, which happens every day. I mean, two cars get a little bit uh, ruined. It's an insurance case. And we think that we, by using blockchain, we can uh, solve it in 30 minutes, all the administrative questions. So you register your traffic accident. We have, of course, uh, online car registry and, and all these elements are there, online insurance, uh, full database of uh, insurance schemes, etc. So we could actually, in 30 minutes, we think, send information to both parts of the accident and, and about how this incident was solved. But for this, we need to have blockchain. Which makes us also to think that when is the point when we need to create a legal uh, entity for a uh, learning or a machine learning system or a machine system. And we feel we are coming quite close to this point. So we are now discussing exactly this, uh, how to regulate, uh, how to regulate uh, well, autonomous systems uh, in our law base. Uh, attribution questions will rise. And then, of course, it will be an interesting question. I think I read it this morning in one Estonian daily. Lawyers were discussing that if a robot kills somebody, then how do we know that the robot uh, did not get the order from its owner to kill somebody, but simply went crazy? And I mean, it's it's not. I mean, it's not a laughing matter. This is the questions we need to solve. And also for our uh, this proactive state, we need to solve this question. And yet again, we need to solve the question of privacy people probably need to somehow opt in to this kind of system, understanding and analyzing themselves whether they want to use or they don't want to use this. So uh, it's, it's not easy, but we are thinking forward and uh, we are forced to think forward because exactly people are asking, you know this, why do I need to apply at all? It's people who want this and, uh, and government, once it has undertaken this digital disruption of society, cannot back off. You have to continuously, all the time, first of all, make sure that the existing systems are still safe to use, that you can patch them up if something goes wrong, and that you can continue developing. And it is also true that sometimes things go wrong. Uh, we have uh, at least two means of identification online. Yesterday, for two hours, one of them was down, the other was working. So you need to have alternatives. But the problem with our country is that uh, you cannot have digital with paper alternative. You have to have digital with digital alternative. And, and uh, we had this problem last year where uh, there is a chip maker whom I wouldn't name, but maybe some of you know, which actually called one billion chips off the market, said that they're not safe to use. Most of these were door cards. High number was actually ID cards, but mostly in the countries which where people have IDs but don't use them, so they could be simply, well, uh, shut down for a while. We couldn't do it. For us, it was vital that the service continues because um, our people refused it otherwise. They, they wouldn't go to offices to queue for services. They even got really angry because some of them finally, most of them could solve the problem online, but some couldn't. And they had to go to a police or border guard office. And then we got loads of complaints that, are you kidding? I had to queue for an hour. And I mean, and then you explain to people that people in Western Europe normally take a day off to register their car. So, <laughs> this is where you have your population and this also demonstrates to you that whatever Estonian government wanted to do, go completely back to paper-based system, for example, it simply cannot. Disruption has happened and now you have to live with the con uh, consequences and work forward to make sure that you are actually well, continuing to provide services to your people to their satisfaction. Which means that even if we are on the Mars already, our people want us to be even further. I mean, uh, so Earth for them is not the solution. <laughs> So wait, should we buy blockchain? Or I wasn't clear. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> I got the answer loud and clear. Okay, so we're going to go to the to the assembled audience here for questions. I think we have about a half hour. Uh, gentleman in the back with his hand raised. And there are, yes, there are microphones. Please, please if you can, uh, identify yourself. And the other guidance I always give is uh, phrase it in a question rather than a statement or a speech. <laughs> Michael Schrag with MIT. Estonia is a very small country, as you pointed out. China, huge country. United States, huge country. Key to making machine learning work is scale. You're a small, you're a scientist, you're from a small country, but you deal with giants and behemoths. What's the most important thing you've learned about managing scale in an environment where petabytes and zettabytes is the future of what you're talking mm -hmm. about? First thing to realize is indeed that scale-wise, um, 
we don't create technology, we use technology quite common in private sector globally. So we don't have to carry the cost. And we fully understand that we don't control uh, the delivery chain of this technology. And this is why we need to make sure with using, let's say, these digital chips that we also have mobile ID, for example, because we simply don't control the technology. But this is what makes it available. If you now look more locally in Estonia, then uh, since we have absolute inclusivity, this digital chip is part of our uh, ID card with which we travel as well, at least within the European Union. Then this inclusivity from the other side is mass market. So for local services, actually, companies have it quite good. They have the 1.3 million market at least immediately at their hand. I thank you for your comments today. Uh, two questions. One, are they related? One is recently Estonia joined a number of other countries, including the U.S., uh, in condemning the NotPetya uh, worm uh, and attributing it to Russia. Uh, this is always a delicate question when you have this kind of collective response. What you know, attribution at the end of the day is a, is a you know, political issue. What level of confidence do you need? Does Estonia need to join that kind of collective because it's more powerful? And then on Russia, what kinds of actions would you think would be effective in actually deterring their behavior in cyberspace? You said that we need to do more. McMaster said that last night. What kinds of things would actually work? In cyberspace, we need monitoring, and we need to agree that international monitoring is allowed and that there will be elements and events which will trigger international monitoring, very similarly as you have sensi with sensitive uh, nuclear uh, technology globally. We need to agree what it is. I gave you a few examples. Radical shift in energy consumption in some laboratory or somewhere is one thing. Second is now we have understood that you, we need to create the, like neural uh, neuron uh, networks to be able to think of AI which will not consume so much energy that it will be dead immediately. These could be regulated. This is hardware, after all. This could be regulated that you need to allow international monitoring. And, and this, uh, well, we need to bring in globally all countries because, as I said, it's not anymore enough like in nuclear case that some countries agree and the rest will simply, well, accept because they don't have the weapons. It's, it's global and we don't know where it, will, where it will happen. So this much for regulation. For confidence level, it's not... Uh, Quantitative, it's always qualitative analysis and depends, well, it very much you have to go case by case. But it's interesting that we join, because for us it's a solidarity act, because not Petya didn't pass in Estonia, only in one international company system which was not linked to Estonian system. Poor act of solidarity. Thank you. Uh, yes, come. <coughs> a friend, Burwell, from the Atlantic Council. Um, two questions. First off, when you are thinking about how to deter or respond to an attack, does it matter if it is a nation state behind it or whether it is organized crime or is it the same response? Same. And, okay. And uh, the other thing is that you raised the issue of taxes. Um, but your approach to tax sounds a little bit different from me from what has been proposed by some EU governments, including in terms of taxing digital enterprises. Uh, which, as you are well aware, some people here fear is aimed primarily at some large U.S. companies in Europe. Can you be a little bit more specific about where you think taxes should go to counter this, to deal with this new world? I can be a little bit more specific, fully aware that first of all, I'm in contra I don't, I'm in contradiction with much of the European thinking plus OECD rules, everything. So we absolutely need to modify international space and we cannot go alone. So we need to first understand that, I mean, we have this problem and then we need to start seeking solutions. And uh, voluntary declaration of my liaison with any chosen state would be actually something which probably is, is, the, uh, is the solution to the problem. And I realize, I mean, that we are very far from, from getting there. Meanwhile, Europe is doing what you always you do in these kind of systems. You apply a patch and then you see what you can do to solve, uh, solve the problem as it is. And I think applying patches meanwhile to make sure that the society is at least accepting that, uh, I mean, we do need to tax differently just because internet exists is, is a step in right direction. Of course, it can be inhibitive to, uh, to some investment and so on, and I'm not necessarily supporting it, but I see where it comes from politically. Uh, I'm Basil Scarless. I've been involved in foreign affairs. 
And I have a question on sanctions. Uh, perhaps uh, a good way to deter Russian cyber attacks and other meddling and uh, military action would be to have a more effective regime for punishing the Russian leader and the oligarchs. And one obstacle is that in the United States and to some extent in the United Kingdom, we allow shell companies to purchase properties, to make investments in corporations and in uh, other organizations without revealing the beneficial owner. They can hide behind an attorney. Uh, the question I have is, do you think it would be much more effective to have targeted sanctions, especially if we could get Congress to pass appropriate legislation? A uh, simple answer would be yes. Uh, then the political answer would be it doesn't concern me because Estonia doesn't have that much oligarchic money in, it, in the country. It's a tiny economy, pretty, pretty transparent as well because digital makes it also transparent. And, uh, and the practical answer is that I think yes, but we must make sure that we remain rule of law countries while we do it as well. This is very important. The, if I could follow on that, th th this issue comes up, it came with the response to the Skripal attack, that the next level would have been true financial penalties for people in power. Uh, you'll often hear, whether with Ukraine, U.S. election interference, about going after Putin's money, uh, whether freezing it or exposing it to, to his people, uh, all of his various holdings around the world. Uh, why hasn't that happened yet, in your view? I simply don't know. That's a good answer. Um, th th there's a group of folks here, but maybe I'll just go from the forward back. There's a gentleman and then behind two, and we'll go from there. <coughs> Uh, Hans Benendijk uh, from SICE. Uh, first of all, let me say it's so refreshing to hear a president be able to converse the way you do on these issues. Um, I'd like to ask about uh, Russian uh, attacks uh, using social media. This is below the denial of service level. Uh, what has been your experience, not just in Estonia, but in, a, in the Baltic states in general, with regard to Russian use of social media to try to affect the opinions of your minorities, the Russian-speaking minorities. What have you been able to uh, do about that? I presume you're countering it. Uh, and what lessons do you have for us uh, in this area? First, uh, Baltic states, well, I cannot say we have seen more of these kind of uh, attacks. I think Germany has had a fair share, and Lisa case, every German knows it. And, uh, and Emmanuel Macron called Putin out on, uh, on disrupting the French election processes. We have been expecting and preparing for when EFP uh, was established that we will have uh, quite some. Lithuania had one, but the reaction was so quick, retaliation from Lithuania to inform people that this is false news, to make sure that everybody got it, it was false news, was so good that we've actually not seen uh, any further elements. But we are, of course, ready all the time. And the only way to be ready is to tell your people this exists. We talk about troll uh, factories, uh, we show people that they do exist, and frankly, try to read uh, an anonymous internet commentary under some article about, I don't know, I do it under my articles about myself. I recognize a troll writing quite soon. They are trying to put the message out about you, which comes whichever way, I mean, it, it comes, and you have a few, few kind of memes which always will appear. And then you learn to recognize it. And, and people, having live and lived a long time in the internet sphere, learn to understand this. Of course, we all have a big problem that uh, most of the population is not able to differentiate between journalism, something which pretends to be journalism, and, uh, and something which think it is journalism. Uh, because there are, well, I think those people who don't realize that they are not journalists, but they don't, don't do it in bad will. And uh, previously, I expected journalists to check their facts when they provide them to me. For some reason, I cannot do it. And I think here is also a frank discussion to be had, because lots of fake news, fake news will die if people knew that uh, safe channels will never pick them up, yet safe channels day after day pick them up. And w we need to radically think how to avoid this. First of all, we all need to start paying for our online news and then we can continue this discussion. I'm sorry it starts with that. Currently, the media sector has no resources to deal with it. There, 
there, there's a couple questions coming in from Twitter's. Uh, so, Madam President, this one is, we have an obligation to explain the issues around privacy and responsibility to citizens, relevant to what you were just discussing. How has Estonia brought citizenry to a level where they can understand the explanation? And I mean, I, I could identify with this because uh, I'm sure, like you, you agree to terms that you don't know or read what those terms are frequently. And uh, so how do you manage that? We have only one set of terms, and this is state guaranteed digital identity. It's not too much to ask people to understand one set of terms and conditions. And the terms and conditions are roughly the same. You keep your identity, physical one, separate from the passwords. And if this, for some reason, was not the case, you run quickly or go online quickly somewhere where you can, well, just close your identity. This is the basic drill. But we have to do it only in one copy because we have the universal system. And that is how we can build trust. And of course, it is government is on the line. It's government which is giving this guarantee. It's not Google or Amazon or, or somebody anonymous uh, or not in your country. And I'm sorry, it wouldn't get better unless more governments take this responsibility. Hey, uh, Matt Leonard with Government Computer News. Can you talk briefly about the uh, data embassy that you guys opened up last summer, um, what its current role is, and any plans for opening up other data embassies going forward? Um, there's not much to talk about. It's a s simple thing. Every private enterprise has a safe copy of everything it has, and if country's legal base allows, it has it outside of the country. Uh, now we have a copy of Estonian state every minute, every moment in, in a data embassy, and since it is state and state data, and we need to make sure that our law base about this data and what applies to this data will apply to where it is. We cannot simply establish a server somewhere. We need to have an agreement with Luxembourg, also very digitally minded and forward-looking country, that we will create data embassy. So this server park is a sovereign territory of Estonia and these servers and this data is, uh, belong to Estonian state. And again, there is nothing technologically interesting. The interesting thing is law space, which we two together created between Luxembourg and Estonia. Whether we need to have uh, more copies, well, uh, time will tell. But I'm quite sure that people would, would be quite happy to host the Estonian data embassy. On the other hand, other states need data embassies too, so uh, they all have data which they need to store. And just, I'm curious, are those updated constantly then? Because it, my, my, if I'm an insurance company, I don't know, today's yes. data is different from next week's data. As I said, all Estonian digital signatures are time-stamped. So in this sense, they are like blockchain, yes. And then, if you still have a question, go over here. Thank you very much. Uh, Grigory Dubovitsky, Russian news agency. Uh, so first uh, question, uh, how do you think Estonia needs more NATO troops to deter Russia? And if so, uh, how many troops do you need? And the second one is about uh, Skripal poisoning. Uh, so Estonia expelled a Russian diplomat, and but the British experts said yesterday that they don't know a region of the agent that poisoned Skripal and his daughter. So do you, uh, do you still believe your actions uh, to expel Russian diplomat uh, was justified? And uh, do you have any evidence of uh, Russian involvement in this poisoning? Or this is just a matter of solidarity with European countries? As uh, most countries stress, they didn't send out simply diplomats. They sent out diplomats uh, who were acting in a way as diplomats shouldn't act. So there was another reason for, for this concerted action. Uh, what uh, what concerns uh, NATO troops? Then uh, NATO deterrence is uh, well has a history of being 100% efficient and effective. NATO has never failed to protect its territory, and it's in in, in its entirety. And uh, we trust into this capacity to deter, and we're quite sure that all NATO steps uh, are always adequate to make sure that this deterrence is uh, is uh, is valid. In the summer, NATO, NATO summit will come together and discuss again those issues and these, those elements. Uh, our role there is to provide honest and open analysis of the se security situation, uh, considering conventional risks around our territory. And among those, uh, well, is the information which we have also told publicly, 
Today, the level of conventional uh, capacity surrounding NATO's eastern flank is at the level of 2009 Zapad exercise. We need to draw conclusions from that. Uh, in the far back here. Hi. Um, so I've read that there are uh, efforts to use blockchain technology in order to, um, for example, in the Estonian stock exchange to make voting easier and uh, more secure and uh, like it, you know, immutable ledger, all that, uh, just, you know, it's distributed. Um, there's also efforts in Australia to, uh, a company called MyVote, I think, um, to utilize uh, the, you know, relatively secure and distributed immutable ledger to, um, help voting, and I've also heard the idea for voter registries. So I'm just curious, um, is Estonia um, considering using blockchain for um, voter database, or uh, yeah, voter registry databases, um, or um, e-voting, like direct e-voting itself for candidates or for referendums at the local level or at the larger level? Um, because I've, I've heard that uh, it's an interesting idea and uh, Estonia seems to be a little bit on the cutting edge of using those technologies. So yeah, just um, uh, blockchain in voting systems, basically, is the question. Um, basically, we have e-voting and this system is tried and tested and free for everybody to try and hack. And voting is the highest confidence level digital service. So you change your voting technology only when you have tried and tested the new technology developments. And you have taught your people that this technology is safe on lower confidence level services. Voting should be the last which will shift uh, technology once you already have an established system of uh, secure voting, which we have. So uh, I predict that uh, all other Estonian public services will be blockchain based before our uh, e-voting system will change. And I always tell to other countries, some, some countries would say, let's start from e-voting. And I always say, that's a terribly bad idea. Start from school applications or something really, well, low, low worry services. Never start from e-voting. You have to teach your population cyber hygiene first. You have to teach them to trust the system and only then you should apply, uh, you should try to, to uh, apply this technology to high confidence level services like voting. On the other hand, Sometimes we get discussion that e-voting must be terribly unsafe and it comes from people who vote by post, so uh, it beats me how discussion can come up, but it does still come up. Well, it, it's a very common fear here, though. I think uh, you would, I, I can't imagine, a, and of course it's run by states here, but I can't imagine a state legislature who'd push hard for it today, because uh, there is that lack of confidence. Um, it, it, question from Twitter here. Uh, Madam President, you speak about the need for government-mandated digital identity Many people are concerned that this gives too much power to governments. Do you see a need for anonymous transactions? And if so, in what cases? Well, I'm, in my character, I'm a simple housewifeish politician. And, and this philosophical question has been bothering me a long time now. Why people in free world trust their banks and Google and Amazon, but don't trust their government? And I don't, I don't know, know the answer, but I think we need to have some really good philosophers and, uh, and social scientists analyzing this question. It's not technology what they are mistrusting. They are not trusting for some reason their government. I don't know why. It may be different in every society. There may be similarities. I come from a society where people trust government in this sense. They don't trust it for, I don't know, having, it, having a good tax system or actually our people are very, very critical about our, our government. It's a national tradition to think we are a badly run country. Uh, I'm not joking. I mean, in 1943, the uh, chairman of the uh, Bank of England, Lord Wedgwood, he said that Estonia was the best run country in Northern Europe. And then one of our politicians said that the other diplomats told him that, and it's astonishing how little your people appreciate it. <laughs> it's still the same, but they trust government when government provides digital services. Uh, there's a gentleman here uh, in, uh, along the aisle, and then we'll go to the back, and I think we're getting down to probably the last question or two. All right, thank you. Uh, Jonathan Lichman from the Providence Group. You've mentioned a couple of um, times about educating the public, cyber hygiene. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what Estonia does with respect to public education 
on cybersecurity and public information uh, in terms of making sure that it's both uh, effective and it reaches everyone? Well, teaching hygiene is not as effective as, I don't know, applying some social services. It never will be, because if you think about when we taught people simple hygiene, it was also a lengthy process, well, which gradually reached our people's brains, that you have to wash hands, otherwise you will fall sick. Or you have to use toilets, because it's not hygienic to just go to the wood. And it took us time. But I think we have nowadays much better communication means to teach our people cyber hygiene. And the truth is, we have to start from this, and many people haven't done it. Technology will not solve it. There will never be a technology which will be able to uh, uh, cover for all human errors. The only way is to tell people that you are responsible. And the way to do it is education. I mean, you have to teach people at school about the risks of internet. We have web police which goes around the schools and teaches children. And it also teaches them that it's just, I mean, if it's not nice to be rude to your, well, the other kids in the class, in real life, it's as rude in internet, etc. It starts from this low level thing. On the other hand, I recognize that most countries are now in bigger difficulty than Estonia because we started teaching cyber hygiene at the turn of the century. And then the risk was some virus and you just downloaded Kaspersky or something else and, and then it was cleared. Now you have to jump into Internet of Things. Yet saying that it's impossible doesn't, I mean, doesn't solve the problem, so we have to try. And I think it has to go down to kindergarten and primary education, this cyber hygiene teaching. Um, oh, right here in the front. And then we'll go to the back if that's okay. Sorry, I'm, I'm having you... Uh... I can, I, I'm pretty loud. Okay. Um, I'm Clara Jordan from the Atlantic Council. What is your take on the, on the really the deadlock on the global discussion on cyber norms? What is your take on, on why the discussion where it, it's where it is right now? I'm disappointed that the process in the United Nations fell through. And uh, I'm quite sure that we need to revive it. Uh, Estonia, among other things, have decided to run for United Nations Security Council, and we are in the active phase of campaign, and whether we win or we lose, this is uh, in our talking points about uh, discussing global security. New Zealand took uh, climate to the Security Council, we will take digital to the Security Council when, uh, when we are elected, and we hope we will be. This is part of our platform, definitely, and we need to continue. There was a working group. Marina Kaljuran from Estonia was, uh, was, uh, was responsible uh, for that work as well, and, and we were deeply disappointed when this got stalled. But the problem has not gone away. Uh, in the back here. Uh, Madam President, uh, Franek Vechorka, Broadcasting Board of Governors. Uh, in this city, there is ongoing discussion on how to counter uh, Russian propaganda, Sputnik RT. Uh, so my question is, do you believe the blocking of Russian TV channels, like it was made in Ukraine, like it will be, it will be in Moldova, in other countries. Uh, is it an efficient measure? Uh, and the second question, do you think, is it a good time for now, especially now for Western countries, United States, European Union, to create, uh, recreate, revive uh, such broadcasters like Voice of America or FRL in Baltic states or Central European countries? Thank you. I don't believe in restricting access to media outlets, even if I don't think they are free media outlets. I believe in telling my people that these are not free media outlets, or this is something which pretends to be media, or it's a government-run media. And uh, we in Estonia, we do not restrict access to this media, yet we discuss this, these channels. And, uh, and uh, everybody is free to choose whether, for example, to talk to them and to how to react to them, but uh, it needs to be known, and this is important. But uh, we need to not only think in the terms of Russia here. I think it would help everybody in this discussion to realize that uh, the sources of fake news are numerous, actually. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty tough on Russia, but uh, I mean, sometimes I feel that people attribute all the problems in the global world to Russia. Fake news can come from everywhere. There are various reasons for producing fake news, including somebody may simply want to sell their products and, uh, and do away with somebody else's. I don't know. Somebody could say that ASICs, uh, ASICs uh, running care is, is dangerous to your legs, and the doctors have an, an analyzed and realized that because the f 
first and the, and the back uh, kind of padding are separate, which is not the case for Nike running shoes, it's dangerous. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we have to analyze this in general and need to teach our people how to check their facts. On the other hand, again, we need to get back a media space which we can trust somehow. Um, I think this, well, let's see. Maybe we have time for two more if they're quick. There's a lady here and then someone who I keep forgetting to go to in the way, way back. Thank you very much. Susan Ness, SICE Center for Transatlantic Relations. Uh, we talked extensively about uh, the fake news issue. Uh, also, within the European Union, there are efforts underway uh, w with respect to hate speech uh, to curtail that through government regulation. Uh, would like to know whether there is a major hate speech uh, problem within Estonia, and if so, uh, what role should government play in curtailing uh, hate speech? Thank you. Uh, first of all, I don't sense that we have a big hate speech problem in Estonia. Second, I think that um, good habits is something which you shouldn't always try to write into the law text because if we do away with good habits and only go by law, then uh, we are not the humankind. We like it and we want it. So I don't believe in regulating everything. I think most people can recognize when it is hate speech. When, when it goes to the territory that considerable losses are occurred to the other party by, by something which has been said, then we have our court system which can provide and solve even in the current legal space for these cases. But I don't think that, uh, well, you should legislate something you cannot define really. So this will have to be the final one and I can only see your hand so I can't say, oh, there you are. Hi. Um, how do you, I mean, in terms of the ever-evolving capabilities of AI, how long until you think machines will supplant the human workforce? Uh, what will the workforce do with their newfound time? And um, I guess that's the end of my question. I'm a politician. I'm Small. not a clairvoyant. <laughs> but uh, first of all, uh, we see already that uh, technology does not only take away jobs, but it creates a, it as well. I gave you a few examples how I think that actually handicapped people, people with high, ho high home bur uh, work burden, like women with small children, they actually are much freer to act in the new technology world uh, actively on the job market. So good things are happening, and they're happening also to people with limited educational skills. For example, traveling YouTube uh, may make quite good money, and it doesn't take a degree at all. So new jobs are coming, I don't know where, but the important thing is that we should actually support this change, not try to hold it back. I'm quite sure that in 15 years' time, in industry, all the things we need will be made with the same proportion of workforce, which is currently in agriculture, 3 to 4% of our workforce, not more. The rest will work elsewhere, and they will do something online. What exactly? Who knows? Some things we can see already, but I'm sure there will be much more new stuff emerging, which we cannot imagine right now. At least I cannot. I have a, well, not very good imagination. Mm -hmm. Madam President, thank you very much. Just a phenomenal discussion. <laughs> <laughs>